Welcome back, all you rebels, for another somewhat technical discussion on Star Wars Destiny. Today, I want to talk to you about some Empire at War cards that appear to be above the established power curve or that have potential to be really good cards waiting to break out. If you've seen my Lexicon video series or you've been a CCG player for a really long time, then you've got a pretty good idea of what I'm going to be addressing in this video. If you haven't or you aren't a seasoned CCG player, then I suggest going back and watching those videos to catch up a little bit on the discussion right here and then come back to this video and give it a watch. For everyone else, we're going to be moving right onto the cards, which I think are going to make a splash in Empire at War. And I'm going to highlight the words, I think, in that statement, by the way. This is not a video on facts, but it will include supporting reasons for each card that I've chosen. And now that that's off my chest, let's finish up this intro. I feel right now that we've since we've seen all the cards and it's been about a week since release, you know, things are sort of on their way to coalescing into a somewhat recognizable semblance of a meta. But it's still super early to tell what's tier one, what's tier two and things like that. But that doesn't stop people from asking. And I don't have all the answers to that question. And no one else does either, so just stop looking and be patient. But I can tell you that how we get to the answer to those questions is by looking at some individual cards, their potential, and perhaps extrapolating some possibilities that could be. All right, so let's do that in a moment. We'll be right back. All right, so welcome back. The discussion here today is really about impact, power level, or splash. And that last word, splash, probably would have been a good word to cover in those lexicon videos. Splash is a metaphor for new cards creating waves in an otherwise calm sea sort of meta. A very well-established meta, one could say, is a bit like a calm sea in that. You know what to expect out of the big decks. There's really not a lot of surprises. And you either keep building meta decks or you try to build counter meta decks, which doesn't work that often because it loses to too many other things and, and other decks and whatever. But after looking at Empire at War as a whole, I think there are some real splash cards in here, and I want to highlight a few of those today. So let's start out right off the bat by talking about the elephant in the room, Thrawn. Yes, boys and girls, Thrawn is now a character in Star Wars Destiny, and his ability absolutely lies far above the established power curve. When he was spoiled, high-level players immediately recognized that Thrawn was going to be an absolute beast. Why? Simply put, he rewards knowledgeable players, and that means players who know the meta. And anyone that has ever met knowledgeable players knows they like cookies, and warm pats on the head. And Thrawn is like getting a belly rub and a foot rub at the same time, while like a bunch of slave Leia cosplayers are feeding you grapes and fanning you with giant palm trees. I'm just gonna let that image like sink in for a minute, okay? And now that I've been paying attention to the forming meadow for the past few days, and I haven't really been giving it, you know, too much credit outside of this card, but this card is probably the most format warping card we've seen in Empire at War. It is a super, super hard counter to Poe Maz and even Rainbow Nines. So one would expect that Thrawn is probably going to be the card that shapes at least the initial meta, if not even the mid to late game meta when it comes to Empire at War. And that's, of course, assuming there is a deck that can keep him alive and allow him to sort of out-tempo the opponent with his shenanigans. Essentially, you know, he is designed for a mill deck, and his primary partner, Unkar, is going to be granting him the unnatural ability to use that tempo to put either vehicles on the table alongside with his very own two-resource die or something like that. And so it remains to be seen sort of if, if a, a more control mill version of Thronkar or the vehicle version is actually going to become like the established uh, way that we use this card. And uh, really, that's going to boil down to which one lies farther above the curve after all the testing. But as it stands right now, it's looking like the mill variant 
will at least be the beginning of everything and will, is acting as a stepping stone right now, even at the time of this video. The next card I want to talk about is getting a lot of discussion, and it's running interference. Heroes finally got a really nice control card here, but is it overtuned? Well, it's kind of looking like that. So let's talk about what RI does by just reading the card. So after you take an action, you may exhaust this support to choose an opponent. That opponent cannot take the same action that you just took on their turn. So, all right. Essentially, it limits your opponent's options, creating situations in which you might force them to make suboptimal choices or choices out of the order in which they may want to play them. So this card totally messes with any tempo the opponent might be trying to create, at least temporarily, by literally imposing your will upon them. Now, you can only use it once per turn, but you can have two on the table, which really creates some serious problems. First and foremost, I think there are a number of game states in which having two of these on the board with Sabine Wren can create infinite looping combos. Uh, you know, that takes a couple of ambush weapons or one ambush weapon and an infamous or an ambush weapon in the discard pile and an infamous with any non-ambush weapon and of course the thermal paint to wrap it all up, right? Now I'm not going to go through all those scenarios as there's likely already a video out there that illustrates it and I know for a fact there's an article that was a decklist posted that addresses several of these scenarios as well. One thing to note, however, is that there are ways to play around this soft turn lock, which is essentially what this card combo with other cards can create but they're not necessarily the most common things we do early in our turns or that we establish early on the board simply due to the way that Destiny is played. And in any case, you might have heard this card being referred to as one such card that creates NPE, or a negative play or playing experience. And anytime an opponent can't actually play the game, a card or a combo of cards is said to be creating NPE of no... People have recently said that Throng card decks are creating NPE. And in the past, people even said that Poe Maz was NPE. So just bear in mind one thing when you think about a card like Running Interference. Fantasy Flight Games doesn't like the existence of abusable loops. So we may very well see an errata in the pipeline for this. Until then, don't abuse this too much, all right? You may not want to upset the balance at your local store try not to be that guy all right so you're looking at this card and i know what you're already thinking but great it's a legendary of course it's good yeah i know it's a legendary but not all legendaries are actually above the curve the x8 night sniper is almost everything you'd want out of a gun firstly it's yellow perfect you're already using yellow stuff. It's got ambush. Awesome. I like taking additional actions. You like taking additional actions. Third, it's cheap at two costs. Like, duh. No wonder it's a legendary. It's, it's almost a friggin' holdout blaster. In fact, it fills basically the same role. But it has a three-for-one pay side instead of a two-for-one on the holdout blaster. And instead of making a shield, it has a disrupt side. No big deal there. So... From a standalone perspective, it's it's a very good card, isn't it? But the X8 isn't just a good card because of all those things. We also have to consider the context of the time in which this card is landing. So I'm a hero player, right? So I'm going to tell you, this blaster gives yellow hero decks a third ambush weapon, which is huge. So two more cards in your yellow hero or yellow splash hero deck now have ambush. For those who are talking statistics, that's 6.7% more cards, and it is 100% worth the spot in your deck for that reason. The problem will be, be figuring out what gets cut now, because this is basically an auto-include in any yellow hero deck or any deck splashing hero that wants ranged damage. You, you just cannot pass up a weapon like this. You weren't passing up Holdout Blaster, right? So you're not going to pass this up either. It takes Yellow Hero further down the road of Awesome Town. And now it does... You're looking at the action on this thing and you're like, eh, it's got a pretty meh kind of ability. It's really nothing to write home about. But the reality is, this card 
could have that action removed entirely from its text, and it would still be an auto-include in the decks I mentioned earlier. It is that good. Oh, and I should probably mention that villains also got access to this weapon since it's neutral. Yay. So, let's give villains some more love while we're at it, right? Buyout is an absolutely sickening card. I cannot even believe this was printed, and I'm not sure what the heck anyone was thinking when they let this pass QA. This card has absolutely no ceiling. You can, you can just mill cards off someone's deck for all the resources you have. The problem here is that decks that can make resources in this new set, namely those Thrawn and Uncard decks that I was talking about earlier, bring this card to a whole nother level. Now, some people are going to feel that I'm blowing this out of proportion, and I'm not trying to. What I am trying to convey, though, to you is that this card is in fact OP, if not broken to some extent, in the context of the Thrawn card deck. But rather than speculate on that too much, let's compare it to another card that functions sort of similarly. So let's go over to the explanation screen for that. The closest comparison I can muster to buy out would be this card, which is Con Artist. And the reason for that is because for the cost of playing a con artist, which is two, you could actually just buy out for two. A con artist, because it's an upgrade, is a much slower play, requiring it to be played also on a, only, a yellow character only, who now might become the target of some serious ire from across the table. And in order for con artists to reach the effectiveness of that two buyout, it takes rolling the special twice. So that's probably going to require two rounds to actually do. So in a sense, buyout is a better card. You might even say it's strictly better for milling purposes, but it also has its weaknesses, right? So while con artist is, you know, not immune to something like Imperial Inspection, which resets the con artist by popping it back to your hand, and that, that obviously sucks, buyout isn't immune to an even more commonly played card, which is friends in low places. So it's really a give and take with something like this, but buyout, to its credit, it's much faster and has a much higher ceiling potentially due to it functioning off resources and you know nothing else. It doesn't need to roll in a die. It doesn't need to be attached to a character. In my honest opinion, because this card is potentially so far above the established power curve for what a mill card can do. This card is the kind of card I would say that you should restrict this to a one of in a deck because personally, I just think it's far too strong to let it be anything else. Anarchy is a very good card for two very simple reasons. Essentially, it's a salvo effect, meaning that you can make a die do spread or AOE damage as it were. The second reason is it's in the money-making color of yellow. So I want you to close your eyes right now and listen to my voice. I want you to imagine that there's a card that costs two and it's red. And you can only use it on ranged damage, but you can make all the damage hit your opponent's characters. <gasps> oh my god. It will probably never see play. But put this bad boy in yellow, where it has some legs, and now you're cooking with gas. The best part, though, you can salvo any yellow die, even a modifier die, to deal damage to all of an opponent's characters. Yeah, I just said all that, and it's right there on the card as well. So the most immediate use uh, would be to find a card with a really large resource side, like, a, I don't know, Houndstooth. You know, I didn't think I was even going to be mentioning Houndstooth, but that's also a really good card. Uh, so with Houndstooth, it actually has a four resource for two side, and you can turn that into four damage to all of, you know, your opponent's characters at the cost of playing the Houndstooth for two and rolling it out. Maybe rolling the natural four uh, for two or focusing into the four for two and then using Anarchy on it for three. And if they discard your Anarchy, eh, just get some resources instead or something with your Houndstooth. But there are actually quite a few other cards that have a three side on them, and they're all over the place, right? Blackmail and, and just a whole number of cards. Flamethrower even has a four melee for one side on it. So you can think of some of the possibilities here for a fairly cool 
AoE damage deck. You know, it's not going to be Pomaz level, but I will say that it, it sounds viable, at least on fringe play, maybe like a tier 2 deck. You know, I think Anarchy is a card that is going to see some sparse play, and sooner or later, someone's going to likely find a deck that's going to take really good advantage of it. All right, folks, we're going to talk about Faint, and the question I ask myself is, where do I even begin with this card? Okay, so the idea behind Faint is to use a character's activated ability twice in your turn. So to really unlock this idea, we need to look at some characters that have pretty good activated abilities. So let's see. Uh, well, uh, there's Thrawn, right? We've, we've talked about him, yeah. Just he's going to probably take two cards from your hand for one resource. That sounds fair. And uh, there's Darth Vader, right? Darth Vader does basically the same thing, except you get to pick the card. So that's similar. Uh, that's, you know, another two disc card. And then, oh, we shouldn't forget the new Kylo. Can't keep him out of the party, right? Uh, he could potentially do four damage for that one resource. So that's pretty good. Man, these are all villains, though. So what hero has a good activated ability that I might want to trigger twice? Oh, Maz. Yeah, 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 Maz. So Maz could resolve four dice in a turn if you already have them in your pool to resolve when you faint and then activate her. Yeah, I guess that's pretty nice and... That's so much less setup than her villain counterparts. No, it's not. All right. Well, faint. Uh, it's a card that is going to keep villains looking far better than heroes for a while, I think. And this card is, it's already having a pretty huge impact. It's, it's being run in a number of decks. Uh, being tested right now and, and I, that I've seen people talk about and post deck lists for and such. And, you know, its use is so straightforward and could potentially be so good for one resources. So do not count this card out. All right, all you villain players, hero players, you can continue to remain seated. Let the hate flow through you, my friends. All you naysayers out there that are saying that Chance Cube is a bust are wrong, in my opinion. This card has the potential to be a three resources for one resource every single turn. It also enables some other plays, like Planned Explosion. Yeah, I know, that's probably not even worth mentioning, but I did anyway. Chance Cube is vicious in decks with Uncar or hero decks with, you know, heavy focus. It's really good to put on mass to let her resolve immediately. And it has uses outside of its resource generation as well. It seems like a pretty nice choice for a Voss deck to give you some card advantage off the table to use with his special. All around, I think it's a very good card in my opinion, and it is going to put more resources on the table potentially. And there are a lot of ways to make that happen. I think that the Chance Cube die also is sort of the kind of die that people might look at and potentially want to remove even if just to screw you out of the one resource you use to roll it in. And I think that kind of psychology in the battlefield adds a lot of depth to strategy. Maybe Chance Cube is like the greatest distraction ever. Like, I don't know for certain yet, but I can tell you now not to count this card out because I think it is going to see a lot of play for all that it does. And I have been saying that since the beginning. I just want to go on the record with that. Never doubted Chance Cube. I think it is a very good card. And y'all are going to see that it's going to be a good card. I hope. Otherwise, i got to quit doing this thing. All right, so I've got four more cards that I kind of wanted to put all together into one screen because, you know, as much as I like them, I don't have a ton to say about them. And these are all the kind of cards that I predict are going to be, you know, seen in the meta or at least considered in some way going forward. And I know that's not a very technical way at looking at cards and, you know, that isn't exactly in the spirit of this channel. But listen, 
I'm allowed to deviate if I want to, okay? You are not my real dad. So the first card is Imperial HQ. And it reads that before you resolve a die showing a resource cost, you may exhaust this support to decrease that resource cost by one. And I think Imperial HQ will see play in decks that it's naturally intended for. You know, decks that have a lot of pay sides. And there's a lot of pay sides heroes in the game. And, you know, it pays for itself on its first activation. So I think that, you know, if it's not a card that makes the top 30 cut for your deck, I think it's right on the outside and could see play in decks just because of that. The second card is one that we've talked about before, and you know it's giving discounts to Blue Hero where they need it the most right now, which is three cost weapons, and that card is Reaping the Crystal, and it allows you to play a blue card that costs three or more from your hand, decreasing its cost by one. And what I want to say about it is that you should watch out for this card because disrupting Blue Heroes might be a bit less effective with this in the meta. It's a very nice card, and you know if nothing else, it deserves to see some play, at least as a one of, uh, index at the very least. The next card is also a blue card, and that's Lightsaber Pull, and it allows you to spot a blue character, search your deck for a blue weapon, reveal it, and add it to your hand, and then shuffle your deck. So right now, as far as I know, this is the only card that actually allows you to shuffle your deck mid-game. Um, you know, for what that's for what that's worth. Um, and Lightsaber Pull has so many interactions now with this new set. We've got a buttload of new lightsabers, and, you know, they're all blue because they're lightsabers. And the combo, specifically with Ancient Lightsaber in this card, is is undeniably good. You know, Return of the Jedi plays could also shine here. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I think talking about this card for days, you know, really won't make it any clearer if you, you don't see it already. It's a pretty good card, and if it's not, you know, in, in a deck right now, then it's just barely on the outside, you know, looking in. The last card that we're going to talk about is Endurance. And, you know, Endurance is a power card, in my opinion. You know, this is a great anti-control card if I've ever seen one. Now, you know, I wish it cost zero, but I could say that about a lot of one-cost events. You know, I would think it'd be really cool if it was zero and it said, you know, play only if one or more of your dice were removed during an opponent's turn and, you know, pay one resource to roll each of those dice, you know, die in. So, yeah, you could roll in multiple die again. You know, but that's not what it says. It lets you roll in one removed die for that particular resource. And I think that is a pretty superb choice in certain decks, like Palpatine decks, you know, for rolling back in one of your one of your die, you know, or just, you know, curing your general die removal sadness because, you know, you roll in these die and you're like, gosh, my opponents keep removing these die. It's really annoying, you know, and um, when it comes to that, Side effects here may include additional damage, disrupted opponent resources, or possibly a groan from across the table. So keep an eye out for this one, as it may be part of some tricky bait plays going forward. Well, those are all the cards that I think are flirting above the power curve in this set, and some others that I think are enabling some fairly wicked stuff as well. You know, whenever a new set drops, people are seeking cards like this, and every one of the cards I discuss here today are being talked about out there for a reason. And I like to think I provided enough of those reasons to convince you, if you didn't already figure them out, or were wondering why they were good, and, you know, you didn't want to seem silly asking someone at your store or posting on Facebook, that's why I'm here. At least, that's one of the reasons. So as always, I want to thank you all for stopping by my channel. I also want to thank everyone who has now pushed the channel over 100 subscribers. You know, and I'm still less than 30 days old. So to me, that is a huge accomplishment, you know, even for our little corner of the Internet. Because I know that there are a lot of content creators out there that you could be watching instead. And you chose to spend some of your time today watching me. And, you know, that makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside or something along those lines. You know, that said, good luck to all of you out there. And I hope that you use this knowledge well. Tell your friends about this channel if you think I can help them learn about the game some more. And feel free to stop by my Facebook page and or my Twitter and give me a follow there as well. You know, if you're into that sort of thing. So until next time, Rebels, may the Force be with you.